Okay, I'm going to talk about truth and post-truth, um, which, you know, as you know, is a topical topic at the moment. And I want to begin by introducing a quotation that I'll come back to at the end. And it's from, remember, I'm American. I'm probably the only American in this group, so I'm going to have these American references. Um, and as you all probably know, you know, there is a second impeachment trial of Donald Trump going on at the moment. I'm going to try not to talk about that too much, but I, I am going to start with a quotation from the first impeachment trial, um, which was back in November of um, 2019. And there was a moment, I don't know if, if, if you were not all following it intensely, good for you. Like it was, you know, one of the many advantages of not being an American because it has just been a nightmare for the past four years. I realize it's been a nightmare for the whole world, but it, it's particularly been a nightmare perhaps for those of us who feel somehow co-responsible. But there was a moment when one of the people testifying at the impeachment hearings of Donald Trump was a lieutenant colonel in the American military who was on the, the staff of the National Security Council, you know, advising the president about the former Soviet space. And this is a man named Alexander Vindman, who is a lieutenant colonel. And Alexander Vindman, um, together with his twin brother and his father, emigrated, which was really defected at the time from Soviet Ukraine in the 1970s, when Alexander and his brother were just children. Um, and they have the kind of love for and faith in America and the American promise that you probably only have if you defected from the Soviet Union and escaped to America you know, in, at that time. Um, and he was, Alexander Vindman was the person on that now infamous phone call um, between Trump and the Ukrainian president Zelensky, who actually, he was the per only person who actually knew Russian and knew Ukrainian and understood the content of the phone call without the interpreter. And he, he got up to testify and he started out in his introduction saying, dad, don't worry. I will be fine here for telling the truth. It was an extraordinary moment, um, you know, in the first place, because of course it was not true. He would not be fine, um, but it was an extraordinary moment nonetheless. And I wanna come back to that at the end. And I want us to think about what that means. I will be fine for telling the truth. And he meant that very earnestly, you know, and one of the reasons it was so poignant was because we were now in a moment where there was no such thing as truth, where nobody was caring about truth, um, where it seemed, you know, a foolishly idealistic thing to say, you know, at such a kind of intensely political occasion. Okay, so now having prefaced my remarks with um, Colonel Vindman, which is, is a totally heartbreaking uh, um, testimony at the hearing, you can all go look it up on the internet, the video is out there, you can watch it anytime. I now wanna take you all the way back to the 17th and the 18th century and the beginning of modernity. I'm gonna talk about modernity because I know that's, that's your topic. Um, and I'm going to start with the claim that modernity begins with the side lining of God. So not yet the killing off of God. The killing off of God comes rather late in modernity. In fact, you could date it fairly precisely, and it's not until the 1880s. But as early as the mid 18th century, God was being demoted. God was being sidelined. He was being moved kind of, he was being moved off stage to a certain extent. Um, his role was being reduced. And the Enlightenment was replacing God with human reason. And that whole process that was centered in France, although not only in France in the 18th century, had to do with the shifting of the focus from God as the center to human reason as the center. 
And keep in mind that God, I mean, God is a multifunctional concept. God fulfills epistemological functions, ontological functions, ethical functions. You know, God as a concept really covers a lot of ground. So you can kind of move God out of the way. You can push him off behind the curtains, but you've got a lot of space to fill. You know, and one of the things I frequently tell my students you know, in my European intellectual history courses is that modernity is all about replacing God. And the short version of the story is that it's really tough to replace God. Um, so I just want to give you a couple kind of key moments to hold on to in this history, since I know that you know, not all of, in fact, most of the rest of you are not historians. Um, and so I'll start by taking you to Kant's very famous essay, Was ist Aufklärung? What is Enlightenment from 1784? Um, let me mention that this was an essay that was written in response to an essay contest. The person who won the first place in that essay contest was actually Moses Mendelssohn, who also wrote a very good essay, although it has not, you know, gone down in history as seminal as Kant's essay, Was ist Aufklärung, which came in second place. But Kant's claim, I mean, there are more complicated things in the essay, but the key thing that he gives you in that essay is a definition of enlightenment. The definition of enlightenment is the, the Ausgang, the kind of the exiting of immaturity. And the slogan that is associated with that essay is Sapera Aude, dare to know, have the courage to use your own reason. What it means to come of age essentially is to think for yourself. So you get this Aufklärung ist, ist der Ausgang. And um, let me, I'll just, I'll read it to you in the original, my bad German accent. My, my eight-year-old daughter, who is a native German speaker, cringes every time I open my mouth in German. She's like, mommy, can you please put away that accent now? I'm like, no, I can't. It's just there. But it, it's, a, it's a key moment in intellectual history. So let me read you the line in the original. Aufklärung ist der Ausgang des Menschen aus seiner selbstverschuldeten Unmundigkeit. Und Mundigkeit ist das Unvermögen, sich seines Verstandes ohne Leitung eines anderen zu bedienen. You know, so it, it's getting out of the immaturity, you know, by which you're not using, you're not using your reason for yourself, you're submitting to the direction of another authority. Uh, this remains the most famous definition of enlightenment, this dare to know. And the key question then for philosophy that comes out of enlightenment and really starts a good century or so before with Descartes is, can we get to truth without God? I mean, what, how do we even know that the world exists if we don't believe in God? How do we know that what is real is real and really there? Okay, I'm going to try to look at this green light, but it's totally dehumanizing. Um, <laughs> Like, how do I know that like this coffee cup is real and it's not just a projection of my imagination? You know, how do I know that the pen, where's my pen? I lost my pen. How do I know that the pen really has a mind independent existence and is not just a projection of my consciousness? And the problem of course, is that I can't step outside of my consciousness, outside of my head in order to ascertain how the world really looks or if it really exists if I were outside of my head. Um, so what comes out of this, you know, and what really, what starts with Descartes and picks up through the enlightenment is this idea of epistemology as first philosophy, which means that epistemological questions, questions about knowledge, you know, what are the conditions by which we can know what are the conditions by which we can know the world? What are the conditions by which we can know what is real? Um, that's, that's where philosophy should start. How do we get to truth? How do we get to epistemological clarity? That's the fundamental question. That's where we start. And the epistemological question is really the problem of the bridge. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna borrow this phrasing from, from Lesha Kowakowski, who is one of the people who wrote about it the best. And I hope that at the very least, the polls among here have read Lesha Kowakowski. If you've not read Lesha Kowakowski, you should all just like halt whatever else you're doing in your lives and, and read Lesha Kowakowski. Um, but he calls this the problem of the bridge and he writes about it very well and very clearly. And he said, and, and the idea is how do you get from subject to object from inner to outer, 
immanence to transcendence, mind to world, consciousness to being. It's all basically different ways of asking the same question. How do you get from what's inside your head to what's outside, to the world does it exist independently? This is the problem of the bridge. You know, and, and when you have God, God is your bridge. God wouldn't trick you. God guarantees you a place in the world. God grounds you. God tells you that it's real. But what happens when you get rid of God? When you get rid of God, then you really can't be sure. It could all be a delusion. Um, so I want to go back now to um, the 17th century with Descartes um, and Descartes' radical experiment. Descartes is not my favorite philosopher, but it's an important place to start. You know, and Descartes' idea is that, and he very much believes in God, but he says you have to make an argument that will convince even people who don't believe in God. Um, so he says, I'm going to start by doubting everything. I'm going to start by not accepting anything as real. And I'm going to see just sitting by myself in my room what is absolutely certain and indubitable, like where can I start? And he says, well, you know, I, I know things about the world based on my, my senses, but how do I know my senses aren't deceiving me? I mean, I know that sometimes they do deceive me. You know, for instance, we all sleep, we all sleep, we all dream. So we know that in our dreams, we think things are real that are not real. So we know that our senses can deceive us. What if they're deceiving us at other times as well? Well, we say, well, God would not trick us. God wouldn't do that. God is good. Okay, but how do we know that? We can't prove that yet. So we're going to bracket that. We're going to put it aside. I said, well, what about, what about if it were, it were not, we don't have anything to do with God? What about if there's some kind of malevolent genius, you know, some kind of, of evil genius that put thoughts in my head that are not real to deliberately try to trick me? This is a, the famous kind of provocation of what if everything I think is real is really, you know, put in my head by an evil genius. How can I be sure? And Descartes says, well, I can't be sure of the veracity of any of my perceptions. I can't be sure of their correspondence with the reality outside of myself. The only thing I can be sure of is that I'm having these thoughts because I am having these thoughts I must exist. There must be an I to have these thoughts. And from this, you get the famous cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. So the only thing you can be sure of at the beginning is that there is a thinking I, there's a cogito. Um, and this is also how we get a legacy where the skepticism in modern philosophy doubts everything except the subject. Consciousness remains that which cannot be doubted, that thinking I. Um, now, at the end of, of Descartes' radical mind experiment, he basically, in my biased opinion, cheats and brings back God and gets everything back. He has what seems to be an extremely dubious proof of the existence of God, by which he kind of returns to God, and then, you know, God ascertains the world. But the idea of, of that being the radical question, how can we be sure the world really exists? And this is the big debate between the realist and the idealist. The realist saying like, yes, the world is real. It's not a projection of our consciousness. It's not produced by our minds. It has a mind independent existence. And the idealists that are saying, you know, it's all about what's inside our head. And then Kant comes along. Um, and Kant makes what, it, what he, he calls the Copernican turn, um, the Copernicanische Wende. Sometimes this is translated as a Copernican revolution. Um, the Copernican turn, as you guys probably all remember, you know, Copernicus. So the idea is that, you know, it's not the sun that rotates around the earth, it's the earth that rotates around the sun. So Kant's big move is to say that it's not the structures of our consciousness that conform to reality as it is in itself. It's that whatever data we're getting, whatever our sensory impressions are from reality in, in itself, that ends up having to conform to the structures of our consciousness. That's the Copernican term. Yeah. Whatever, we're, whatever input we're getting has to fit into the structures of our consciousness. 
And Kant is, Kant is an interesting figure. I like him better than Descartes, but that's just a personal thing. Um, he basically says that, yes, there is a real world. There's a mind independent existence. I believe that. But he says, we have no access to it. There's no way to get outside our own consciousness and see what the world would look like, what, it, what truth would be if we weren't inside our own heads. He says, so let's just forget about that question because the world in itself, things in themselves as they truly are, the pure truth, the, the ding on zik, um, we have no access to that. So let's just put it aside. It's an empty concept. And like some of the polls might know the work of, of Krzysztof Michalski. In fact, I think today is the, the eighth anniversary of his death, which is a death to which I still cannot reconcile myself. But he would, used to talk about the ding on zik as like, it's an empty concept. It's reality as it is not and can never be known and therefore it is useless. Um, so Khan says like, let's just forget about that ding on zik, the thing in itself, you know, that, that jet sum of Sylvia and let's, start talking about what we can know on the basis of things as they appear to us. So he's a Kant is radical in his moderation. You know, he's making a lot of compromises. He's saying, yes, there's a real world, but no, we don't have any access to it. So he brokers the compromise between idealism and realism. He also brokers a kind of compromise between empiricism and rationalism. He says, yes, there are things that come to us, part of how we think we get from our empirical intuitions, you know, from our impressions of the world. But part of it is kind of hardwired into our brain, things like space and time. Space and time are not sensory perceptions. He says they're like part of the hard wiring. They're like, they're part of the structures of our consciousness. Okay. Anyway, um, so this is Kant. So, you know, we're in like the, the late 18th century, um, trying to find a bridge to the world in the absence of God. And for those of you who read Kant, you'll see that you know, when he, when Kant gets to God, it's in a totally different book. So he has his first critique, you know, which is all about epistemology. And then he goes on to his moral philosophy and he uses a totally different method. You know, so he's intensely kind of technical, you know, and pushing the boundaries of reason and science and logic and his epistemology. And then he gets to God, free will, the immortality of the soul. And he's like, listen, these things can't be proven. We've just got to posit them and move on. Just kind of like that. Like we need free will because if we don't have free will, it can't have morality, can't be proven. Let's, let's just move. Um, Anyway, this problem of, of how you get a bridge to the world without God, you know, is, is the philosophical problem of modernity. And it's related, you know, to what, you know, Arendt describes this as, and she's not, not alone here, as the problem of modernity. You know, the great problem of modernity is the problem of alienation. Um, we are alienated from the world. The self is alienated from the world. We have lost our grounding. We have no guarantee of truth. We have no guarantee of epistemological clarity. Hannah Arendt actually blames Kant for this. She blames Kantian fatalism. I don't think Kant would have called himself a fatalist, you know, but I think she says once Kant says there's no way we're ever going to get to that ding on sich, you know, Arendt is like, that's it. How can we ever have a home? in this world from which we never actually have access to the pure truth. You know, we're always going to suffer from alienation. The self is alienated from the world. You know, she'll also describe this as, as Bodenlosigkeit, this feeling of being without, without a ground. Um, now it's not, it's not until the, you know, the 1880s that, that Nietzsche and, and Dostoevsky actually kill off God. Um, but the precedent is already set when you start sidelining God. Uh, the next big attempt to put it all back together again is Hegel. Um, and Hegel tries to give us back our connection to the world, our home in the world, our possibility of de-alienation and connection with truth by injecting history into the equation. 
making history not just something on which philosophy is kind of imposed, but a constituent element of philosophy itself. You know, and Hegel essentially says like the subject and object, inner and outer, consciousness and world, particular and universal, the is and the ought, freedom and necessity, it's all going to come together at the end. You know, through this dialectical process of, of Althebung, you know, of, of this continual, you know, overcoming or sublation, we have no good translation of, of Althebung in really any other language. Um, from the point of view of the end, Hegel says it's all going to make sense. It's all going to come together. But meaning will only come in retrospect. We're only going to really see the truth when it's all over. Um, this is Hegel's famous owl, owl of Minerva, the owl of Minerva, the goddess of wisdom, you know, that takes flight only with the coming of the dusk. So it's only, it's only looking back that you can see the truth, that you can see what it all meant. And Hannah Arendt says, you know, the thing about Hegel's attempt to reconstitute a world now shattered into pieces is that we could never be sure whether what Hegel then gave us, you know, as a way of reconstituting our world, you know, at leaving us, you know, at healing our alienation from the world, we could never be sure if what he gave us was a residence or a prison for reality. Now, one of the things that was so seductive to Hegel was not this teleology that promised reconciliation and meaning and truth and everything coming together at the end, but it was also this seduction of wholeness, that everything gets synthesized and spun together. You know, and the, the famous line that captures this from the beginning of Phenomenology of Spirit is, das Vater ist das Ganze. The true is the whole. You can't understand truth except from the perspective of the whole. And you never actually get the perspective of the whole until you've gotten to the end of history. So really you can never get it in real time. But the idea that the, the, the seductive part is not only that moving forward, but also that promise of wholeness. You can't understand one thing without understanding them all. In order to access the truth, you need to see the whole. You can't get truth in pieces. Um, Okay, um, let me now let me now kind of move you on. And if I know I'm probably talking too long, another 15 minutes, I want to like, you know, be at the end of postmodernity here, but there are just a couple more little steps I want to take you in. Um, are you guys following me? Yes, kind of. Okay, excellent. Um, I was giving the lectures in my lecture class this year to my eight-year-old daughter, Stuffed Animals. I was recording them and posting them for my students. And I found weirdly, like when I would give them actually live, I never went over time. It was a 50-minute lecture. I talked to 50, 50 minutes and the students would go home. And now I found I was like talking for 75 minutes to like, you know, a stuffed hedgehog because the hedgehog was never giving me the feedback that like it had gotten the point and I could move on. So I just kind of kept talking and talking, waiting for some response. Um, let me move you quickly through, you know, Husserl and, and Heidegger. So then Husserl comes along and he just can't stand Kantian fatalism. I mean, Kantian, Kant wouldn't call it fatalism. He would probably call it epistemological modesty. Um, but for, for Husserl, it was just unbearable. He couldn't understand this idea of the ding on zik that was always going to be beyond our reach. And he comes along and he is the Obama-like, yes, we can guy. You know, he was insisting, yes, we can. We can get to absolute truth. We can get to epistemological clarity. We can, we can, we can. And if we can't, then we might as well all commit suicide now because there's just no point. You know, without that kind of clarity about the truth, there's no point in your humankind going on. And the stakes were all or nothing for him. And Husserl does this by this move that is really in fact quite close to what Kant does, except that Husserl thinks he has left Kant in the dust and is so far beyond him, although he has a very admiring, you know, almost worshipful relationship to Descartes. Um, Husserl does this by saying that the thing about consciousness is that it's transitive. Um, 
and the word transitive in the sense of a transitive verb. You know, so I have a book, you have something, a verb that takes a direct object, a verb that takes something in the accusative case. And Husserl says consciousness is accusative. It's not I think, it's I think an object. I think something. There's always an object. That's what he's going to call the intentionality of consciousness. Uh, he said the intent, the very structure of human consciousness is intentionality. Intentionality for him is the bridge between subject and object. And you can kind of imagine it, although Husserl would never have used this metaphor. It, intentionality here is not intention in the sense of absicht or zamiar. It's not like I, you know, intend to write that paper tonight or intend to call my parents. Intentionality is a structure of consciousness that's like a string with a magnet attached that's always reaching out to grab that object. Um, and the, the philosophical move here is to say that in the beginning is the relationship, that subject and object are connected in such a way that they cannot be disconnected, that the subject is always kind of reaching into that object. There's no prior moment. So instead of starting with the subject and trying to work your way back to the world or starting with the world and trying to work your way back to the subject, you know, you start with intentionality, which is the relationship between subject and object. Okay, I'm gonna to try to stop. The other thing is I always talk with my hands and that's terrible on Zoom. I have like a crochet needle here to like try to remind me not to do that, but I noticed I'm doing it again. Um, intentionality is the bridge. Subject and object are always connected. There's not a moment before they're connected. Um, Leszek Kokoski, in a, a beautiful series of lectures he gives about Husserl in the early 1970s at Yale, shortly after he's forced out of Poland, you know, he says that you know, Husserl's attempt to get to absolute truth and pure epistemological clarity was the most profound, the deepest, the most far reaching attempt we have in all of modern philosophy. You know, it, it's beautiful, it's dramatic. Kowalkowski says, nonetheless, he fails. He fails as all such attempts are doomed to fail because the problem of the bridge is insoluble. There is no logical passage. You know, there's no logical passage from inner to outer, from subject to object. You're always, there's this abyss. There's no way around it. Okay. The next, the next moment then here, um, I want to take you is into Heidegger. And I realize this is ridiculous that I'm giving you two sentences on Kant, two on Husserl and two on Heidegger, but I'm trying to kind of sketch a kind of narrative arc um, that will hopefully make some sense in the next 15 minutes or, or might not, we'll see. So Heidegger comes along and he, so if Husserl tries to radicalize Kant's move, you know, and eliminate that ding on Zeke that can never be reached, Heidegger then tries to eliminate Husserl's, tries to radicalize Husserl's move. So Husserl is saying subject and object are always connected. In the beginning is the relationship. And Heidegger says, well, first of all, this whole epistemological question, it doesn't really make sense to start off with it because before we're asking, what does it mean to know, to know the truth? We have to ask, what does it mean to be? And in any case, who can even pose this question, whether it's about knowing or being, other than we ourselves, the kind of beings whom we are, which Heidegger calls Dasein, um, and then as you know, kind of Dasein is being there. So you're kind of, it, it, it's fleshier. It's not like Husserl's transcendental ego, which is bodiless. Um, Dasein is always someplace taking up space. And Heidegger says, okay, the kind of beings we are, we're the only one who can ask the question of does the world exist? The hamster can't ask, you know, the ants can't ask, my dog can't ask. We're the only kind of beings who can ask. And the thing is, we are always already in the world. This is this Immerschon in der Welt. There's an Immerschon in der Welt, this Immerschon in der Welt sein. Um, we're always already in the world. There's no place outside of the world to which we could retreat in order to ask the question, 
as a subject gazes on an object of whether the world exists, because we're always already inside. There's no distance. There's no way to get distance. We're not in the world the way that like a bird is in a cage or a cookie is in a jar. We're not in the world in such a way that we could, you know, theoretically be removed from the world. We're always already in the world, you know, immersion of the Welt geworfen, you know, thrown into the world. This is our geworfen height. If you didn't know the world, the word geworfen height, you know, your, your life has not been complete. You should definitely, you know, note the word geworfen height. And when the plague ends and you can go to cocktail parties again, you should try to use it because it's lots of fun. Geworfen height, you know, our thrownness, we're always already thrown into the world. And so it makes no sense to ask this question. Now, then the big question is, if Dasein is, is always already in der Weltsein, do we then still have a subject that can be disarticulated from an object? You know, has Heidegger radically collapsed the distance between subject and object? Or is there no distance at all anymore? Is it just much closer or is there no distance at all? If there's no longer a subject that can be disarticulated cleanly from the object, then is there any subject at all? So you can read this. So we're, we're moving from a model or a paradigm of a subject and an object, and how do you close that gap? Or how do you connect the subject and object? So we're moving from a subject object paradigm to a paradigm of embeddedness. And there are two different, I mean, there are zillions of ways to read this, but there are two main ways to read this. And the whole interpretation of being in time, which comes out in 1927, hinges on how you read, you know, Dasein as, you know, in der Welt sein. You can read it as the thickening of the subject, a fleshier subject, a more grounded subject, a more real subject, not just this this brainy but bodiless cogito floating around that's transparent. So you can read it as a kind of a fleshing out of the subject, or you can read it as the dissolution of the subject entirely, because there's no longer a subject that can be cleanly separated from the object. Um, as, in some sense, those two radically different interpretations explain a lot about where this philosophical tradition goes in Eastern Europe in the 70s and 80s on one hand, you know, and in France in the 70s and 80s on the other hand. Um, and, and one of the things I, I, I realized that, you know, I haven't even given you a passage from Big in Time, I've given you my three sentences about it, but I'm hoping you can see that in that book, both interpretations could be valid. I mean, you can, you can reason them both out. Um, you can, I mean, you could, by the same token, you can read Dasein as a radicalizing of responsibility because we're always inextricably bound up in this world, or you can read it as a dissolving of responsibility because there's no longer an autonomous subject. There's no autonomous space. Okay, um, so let me now kind of move you into totalitarianism, which is not so cheerful, but well, try to get through it. Um, the, short, the, the short version of this section is totalitarianism, do we blame Hegel or Heidegger or, or both? Um, so with Heidegger, the question is asked, does he dissolve the subject? Um, with Hegel, the question is, what is the price of wholeness? you know, or what, and what is the, the price of teleology? Is it in essence dehumanize it? Um, and we can, we can come back to this later, but I wanna now take you through a little bit of how Hannah Arendt kind of drawing both on Hegel and Heidegger and this whole very rich tradition of continental philosophy, um, how she explains what happens to truth in the 20th century, you know, during totalitarianism. And she talks about ideology in Origins of Totalitarianism as not so much an idea as the logic of an idea. The idea that everything can be explained and derived from a single presence, from a single premise. 
the idea that there's a logic inherent in an idea that will move history forward. So racism, not just as the belief that one race is superior to another, but she says as the belief that there's a motion, there's a historical motion and a logic that plays out inherent in the very idea of, of race. And she says that what, what the logic of the idea does that is so seductive is that it, it can eliminate from real life the randomness and contingency that is empirical reality. And let me just read you a, a couple key quotes from Origins of Totalitarianism. What the masses refuse to recognize is the fortuitousness, the kind of the, the randomness, the coincidentality, the kind of chigoldnost that pervades reality. They are predisposed to all ideologies because they explain facts as mere examples of law and eliminate coincidences by inventing an all embracing omnipotence which is supposed to be at the root of every accident. Totalitarian propaganda thrives on this escape from reality into fiction, from coincidence into consistency. Totalitarian movement, she says, conjure up a lying world of consistency, which is more adequate to the needs of the human mind than reality itself. The uprooted masses can feel at home and are spared the never ending shocks, which real life and real experiences deal to human beings. So the thing about ideology is not just that it's a false reality, but it can create a logical reality that is more logical than actual reality, that because there's a consistency to it, because all the arbitrariness and randomness has been eliminated and everything has been spun into a whole. It therefore has an advantage over truth because the truth of naked empiricism is always that lots of things happen for no particularly good reason. The kind of random, arbitrariness, coincidence, luck, sheer luck that pervades reality is unbearable to people. And she, she develops this more in a short essay um, published in 1967 called Truth and Politics, which after Trump won the elections in 2016, I made all my students read. Um, I hadn't taught it before, but it was an extreme situation. They all had to read it. Um, and she starts out there by, kind of by distinguishing two kinds of truth that philosophers work with. She says there is the rational, the, the kind of the, the rational transcendental a priori truth, which is truth that is prior to and independent of experience. The model for this is mathematics. Two plus two equals four, always, everywhere, necessarily, universally. You don't need to count two jelly beans. You don't need to come into contact with peanuts or M&Ms. You don't need to have any experience of it. You can get to it before any experience just on the basis of working it out in your head. Um, so there's those kind of logical truths, mathematical truths. She says, then there are empirical truths, factual truths, things that are true because they happened. And the example she gives is that, you know, Germany invades Belgium in 1914. That's an a posteriori truth. It's a truth after the fact of experience. It did not have to happen. It's true because it did happen. So there is no law of physics that necessitated that such an event take place. It's a truth after the fact. And she said, the thing about empirical truth is that it will always be vulnerable to political manipulation because it will always bear the vulnerability of its original contingency. And I'll, I'll read you a quote from Truth and Politics. For facts have no conclusive reason whatever for being what they are. They could always have been otherwise, and this annoying contingency is literally unlimited. It is because of the haphazardness of facts that pre-modern philosophy refused to take seriously the realm of human affairs, which is permeated by factuality, or to believe that any meaningful truth could be discovered in Kant's melancholy haphazardness of a sequence of events which constitutes the course of this world. And she says that what happens under totalitarianism is a shift from the pre-modern lie, which was like a tear in the fabric of reality. 
And the careful observer, the historian looking back, could spot the place where reality was torn and sewn back together. There's always a trace, there's always a seam. She said, the thing about totalitarian lies is that they were not tears in the fabric of reality. They were complete reconstructions of reality in such a way as to be seamless. So there was no tear to spot. There was no tear to spot because everything has been spun into this hole where everything that happens is the example of some necessary logic that has been spun in such a way as to be much more logical than reality itself. Um, said in this way, the liar can be much more persuasive than the truth teller because reality on its own is pervaded by all sense of ir all sorts of irrational things that are unexpected, random, and arbitrary. Um, so this the price of wholeness, um, be it under Nazism or under Stalinism, of consistency of meaning with lies. Um, which could also be the price of the destruction of the subject. I mean, there was an uh, obvious enormity of this experiment of wholesale recreations of reality. And there, were, there was an enormity of the failure that we're still trying to come to grips with it. And Hegel describes this as quantity changing into quality as moments when changes in scale become changes in kind. You know, the, the great terror gist of 1937 to 1938 there were 681,692 executions during the collectivization famines of 1931 to 1933. You have about three and a half million deaths in Soviet Ukraine, about one and a half million deaths in Soviet Kazakhstan, half a million or so in Russia. Um, over one and a half million people, maybe up to three million people died in the Gulag. Together, Nazism and Stalinism killed 14 million people between 1933 and 1945, between the Baltic and the Black Seas alone. So th the price for these seamless reconstructions of reality for this wholeness was very high. Um, Postmodernity then comes as a reaction to that nightmare, as a reaction to that hell. Now, back in 1848, you know, Marx and Engels wrote all that is solid melts into air, this alles standische und stehende verdampft. Um, they were premature. All that was solid did not vaporize until more or less 1968. Um, more or less 1968, you get that turn from modernity to postmodernity. And if modernity was all about trying to replace God with something still more solid, more logical, more reliable, that turns into this totalitarian nightmare. Moder Postmodernity begins at the moment when we give up on replacing God. There's no God, there's no ersatz God, you know, there's no fill-in God, there's no transcendental signify, there's no one holding the system together, there's no logical consistency, there's nothing. Um, Zygmunt Bauman described this as, as, as liquid modernity. And he said, you know, modernity was all about trying to replace the old solids with something still more solid. Um, and then liquid moder and then postmodernity was liquid modernity, where you just decide you don't even want anything solid. You, it, you give up on firm grounding. You decide like, hey, you know, forget it. That wasn't as good as we thought it was. You know, you can keep your firm grounding. We are just going to embrace contingency, ambiguity, fluidity, impermanence, uncertainty. Um, so, you know, part of this could be read as a kind of giving up born of despair. Part of it came from a feeling that absolutist claims to truth led us into an abyss of totalitarianism. And for somebody like Derrida, you know, deconstruction was the least necessary condition for identifying and combating the totalitarian risk. You know, so when you, you think yourself to the point where, okay, we're always already bound up in the world, 
moving with that world, involved in that world, shifting with that world. There is no solid, stable subject that can be cleanly disarticulated, you know, nor is there any solid meaning or solid truth that can be disarticulated. Everything is always moving, interrelated, involved, taking one another apart, undermining itself, playing off one another. Um, there's, there's nothing solid to hold on to. But for Derrida, that meant that everything was at play. For him, it was a joyful affirmation of the contingency and creativity and variability and potentiality in the human condition. And it was that which would protect us from falling into the absolutist truth claims that led us into totalitarian totalitarianism. So postmodern philosophy was inspired by this very moral desire never again to fall prey to those grand narratives, to those seamless reconstructions of reality. The idea that meaning, truth, subjectivity, everything flickers. It's all fluid. I mean, you can see it as an affirmation of subjectivity in its freedom of the self that is not solid as being a space for creation and recreation. Some people say that this, this infinite meanings, infinite selves, infinite truths, effectively means no meaning, no self, no truth. Derrida would say that's not true. Infinity and nothingness are two different things. You know, Hegel would say that's dialectics. Um, you, can, you can muse yourselves over whether no meaning is the same as infinite meanings. Um, yeah. Bauman uses the example of, you know, multiple authorities means effectively no authority. It's either single or it doesn't exist. But it's an argument worth having. But this fluidity, this openness to infinite possibilities is also a kind of unhinging. Um, there's no stable ground. And this is also what, what Arendt is calling Bodenlosigkeit. Without truth, there's no stable ground. And if there is no determinate truth, if reality is constructed by discourse composed of signifiers, always at play with one another, then does any reality exist at all that we should feel attached to? So what I want to argue here is that post-truth, um, which, which comes out of a postmodern philosophy that was in large part conceived by the left as a safeguard for pluralism and an antidote to total totalizing ideologies has today, half a century later, kind of become a weapon of an encroaching neo-totalitarianism of the right. I'm not saying this was Derrida's fault in any kind of personal subjective sense. I just kind of want you to see the intellectual genealogy. Um, I'll, I'll give you, maybe I'll just, I know I'm talking too long, let me just give you one or two brief examples. Some of you, the polls here, let me see. Has, have you guys seen the film Chess Wuhanya? Has anyone of your generation seen the film Chess Wuhanya? The interrogation. If you haven't, you should all immediately do that. It's this fantastic performance by Christina Yanda. Um, it's also the only time, as far as I know, that Agnieszka Holland appears on the other side of the camera. She plays a cameo role in this film. In any case, um, so the, the, um, it's the interrogation in English. It's Chess Wuhanya in Polish. Um, it was made around 81. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it was made around 81 and it, it's set in Stalinist Poland. The heroine is this young nightclub singer named Tonya who during the Stalinist period is thrown into prison and accused of being the lover of, of a spy. Um, she denies everything. She's confused. She doesn't understand what's going on. None of it makes sense to her. Um, and then, you know, basically we're kept in this prison cell with her for two hours as she's tortured. Um, it, it's a very intense communing with Stalinism. It's not pleasant, but it is, a, it is one of the great movies and one of the great films ever made about Stalinism. Um, but what's interesting about it in this context of post-truth, and this is a solidarity era film, the 1981 film, is that you see how through this torture and these interrogations, the heroine Tanya, you know, gradually, you know, admits or allows herself to be manipulated into agreeing to more and more of the narrative put to her by her interrogators, although never to all of it. And at the end of the movie, I, I realize I'm, I'm giving this away, but it's still worth seeing. You never find out exactly what happened. You know, you never find out if, 
if Chris, if, if Tanya, like, was she actually the lover of this particular man? Was this man a spy? If she was his lover and he was a spy, did she know, you know, those things are never cleared up. So there's epistemological unclarity at the end of the film, but there's not ontological unclarity because we are given to understand that there is a true version of these events. We don't find out what they are, but we have no doubt that there is a real story, that it's not just a matter of feeling or opinion, or maybe this, maybe that, maybe all of them at the same time. No, something happened. There's a real story. The truth is out there. We just don't get access to it. So this distinction between epistemological unclarity and ontological unclarity is exactly what is broken down under post-truth. And post-truth is that moment when you actually decide there's no longer a, a meaningful difference between truth and lies, you know, not only in terms of whether or not you can access the truth, but in, the, in their existence at all. Um, Peter Pomerantz of, you know, wrote this book, Nothing is True and Everything is Possible. Everything is PR. This was about Putin's Russia. There's no longer a distinction between reality and reality television. People aren't even trying to work it out. Um, there's a very good book by Natalia Rudakova, um, a, a Russian-American anthropologist called Losing Pravda, Ethics and the Press and Post-Truth Russia. And she says that ironically, epistemological realism survives the Soviet Union. People know they're being lied to, but they also think there still is such a thing as truth. She says it's only in the 1990s with the wild capitalism that there's a prostitution of journalism, you know, and the notion that there is such a thing as truth we should care about at all is eroded in the former Soviet space. Um, so this is kind of where I want to kind of bring you up to this world in which 2016, the Oxford Dictionary declares post-truth as word of the year. There was a satire in the New Yorker during the Republican debates when, when Trump's candidacy emerged about the fact checker who passes out from exhaustion after the Republican debate. Um, the notion that there are such a thing as alternative facts that there's no longer a distinction between the fact and the opinion. Um, so I, I just want to end by, by going back to um, poor Colonel Vindman, um, for whom things were not very easy. And this moment when I was, I was listening to this at my office at Yale, and he said, don't worry, Dad, you know, here I don't have to be afraid to tell the truth. And what was heartbreaking about that was like both that it, it you know, it wasn't true. I mean, of course, he did have to be afraid. But because when Vindman said, I don't have to be afraid to tell the truth, that was not truth in the American sense of the word truth. That was, that was pravda in the way that Václav Havel talked about jit pravda, to live in truth. You know, that, that was truth as it existed in the dissident philosophy of the 1970s and 1980s. The belief that the antidote to totalitarianism was truth, that, that to be a free person was to live in truth. You know, the, the Czech philosophers used the word pravda as if it had the, the reality and, and the, the palpable nature of like your keys. You could hold on to it. And you could put it in your pocket to live in truth. Um, truth was active. You sought it. You lived in it. And the philosophical move here you know, was to resist the postmodern turn and say epistemological questions are always already ethical questions. That's the move that Kolokowski ultimately makes in those lectures about Husserl. And he says that, you know, Husserl fails as all such attempts to reach absolute truth will fail because the problem of the bridge is insoluble. There is no magical passage. But Kolokowski says, you must put aside the understanding that we will never find that bridge and you have to keep looking. Because if you give up on truth, you've given up on ethics. Um, so that the move that was made you know, in this space in the 70s and 80s was truth was active. You lived in truth, you sought truth. What you needed to get to truth 
was a fully grounded subject. Anna Miknik liked to talk about podmiel tovost. In Polish, you can actually distinguish subjektivnost from podmiel tovost, which I don't think you can do in German or in English, but subjectivity as this I-ness, this self-ness, to be a subject as opposed to an object, to be an active agent as opposed to a passive recipient. And the idea was that this thickening of the subject was not what relativized truth, but what grounded truth that truth and subjectivity were linked through responsibility. And it was a different reading of Heidegger. You know, it was a reading of Heidegger that says that this, that this involvement, you know, in the world that could not be extricated was a radicalization of responsibility, of our responsibility for truth, as opposed to the withdrawal. Um, Havel writes in the, the Power of the Powerless that Jan Patochka used to say that the most interesting thing about responsibility is that we carry it with us everywhere. Um, so this robust subjectivity, the subject responsible for seeking truth does not preclude an ontological real truth, but is a precondition for that truth. Um, so I just want to leave you with this idea um, from maybe Adam Miknik's last conversation with Václav Havel before his death, which was published in, in Gazeta Wyborcza, for those of you who read in, in Polish, where, where Adam asked Havel, what advice would you have for a young person today who would come to you and ask, how should I live? And Havel says the fundamental imperative, you live in truth. Mm -hmm.